Hello, one and all. Um, this is an introduction to my book, Curf. In fact, it's the literal introduction. So what I'm going to do today is read you the introduction from my book, Curf. Curf has been published by the 87 Press. It's available at this time uh, on the 12th of October 2022 to pre-order. And it will be available to order soon. I'll put the details in the description of this video. I'll also be putting a the whole transcript of what I'm about to read from Curve uh, in the introduction. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this book, um, just to say that it has lots of interesting uh, pictures of my notebooks uh, throughout, um, and it's beautifully uh, constructed. Um, and the introduction says quite a lot really. It introduces the poems of the book. So I'm just going to read this to you now. Curf. Lots of definitions. One, the act of cutting, a cut, stroke, power of cutting, now rare. Two, the incision made by cutting, especially by a saw, 1523. Three, the cut end or surface on a tree or branch, medieval English. Four, a cutting of anything from 1678. Referring to etymologies offers a performance of authenticity and of rootedness. I'm keen on such pretensions. The Old English origin of the word curf is pleasing, curf, like putting on, on an ornately camp curse on someone. The voicing is pleasurable from the throat back guttural tenuis through the gentle explosion of the labiodental spirant. Curf. The word refers simply to the hole created in wood by a saw blade. The size of the curf depends on the size, width or set of the quartz saw blade. With a sharp and accurate blade, a two inch cut will create the equivalent hole in wood. Knowing one's curf, as no one said, is like knowing, not knowing one's worth. It's important to account for curf when measuring and cutting wood, as such offcuts aren't coming back. Cutting a two by four in half is in fact cutting two separate pieces with the middle curve cut absent. If you want to measure and build accurately, you need to know how much of the wood your saw blade is taking out. I discovered the word in the last few years. It was described accurately by one YouTuber as an essential word to know if one is to become a proficient woodworker. I am becoming a proficient woodworker, but as I am also a writer, Part of the mastery of this craft, for me, requires learning the specialist vocabulary of this field. Rooter, awl, shakes, chamfer. See the glossary for some delights. My developing interest in woodwork was enabled by a fortuitous move to a small cottage in central Bedfordshire, whose garden happened to possess a small brick and already electrified outhouse. This is now the workshop, or atelier, uh, of GSF Woodwork. Find them on Instagram and Etsy. My woodwork journey began making some crudely designed and poorly constructed and slightly wonky shelves for my study. There they are. <clears throat> Over time, I've become a little better with every build, aided by many books on woodworking techniques, tips and trips, uh, tricks, ample hours spent envying workshops on the YouTubes, and many, many, many days of error and trial. Why am I writing this? Well, curve is not only a practical concept for application, but a concept enabling abstractions about the practical. Curve for the detritus, the excess, the rejected parts of woodwork on wood, never to be regained and usually forgotten about after, after extraction. Curf is the ever amassing subject, uh, silent abject of any wood project. To recklessly allegorize, allegoricalize the word, we might, I thought, consider other instances of curf in our everyday wor worlds. In other words, curf might be a useful, if clunky, metaphor for many rejected, marginalized, or essential but disposable things and people. We might, for example, think about people, processes, and institutions who are treated as or who produce curf in society and culture. Some people, some some people could could be some such people could be those with disabilities, minority or minoritized people, peoples and cultures, as well as the labor processes and exploitations under advanced capitalism. Interesting. 
But the triteness of the metaphor itched. I may not be able to write clearly about any of these things without reducing them to the status of a worthily performative poetics, art for tart's sake. I don't want to do that. The poems of Kerf do feature veiled veins of the above ideas, but its abiding, abiding themes are probably woodworking, craft, labour, autism, and in particular, the unique languages and language practices of each of these non-discrete areas of activity. A reader may put these themes in their backpack to extract and chew as they journey through this book. But two points of interest about this author might also be of relevance. He is a neophyte work woodworker, as we know now, and he was diagnosed with Autistic Spectrum Disorder, AESD, or in old money, Asperger's Syndrome, at the age of 40. While all the poems overtly hint and covertly glimpse these things, the last long poem sequence, called What's That Instead of Ego, attempts to write about three things at once, the pl planning and execution of a non-specific woodwork project, woodworking and craft in general, and the strange process of being diagnosed with ASD. It might not be a coincidence that I have found solace in the solitary wordlessness of woodworking. It is a labour process to which I, I can entirely give myself for hours and days, with only mumbles, grunts, and repeated and unaudited stims to accompany me. I like the repetition, order, and logic of woodwork. I also like retreating with them from the responsibilities of performing social interactions with boring language, avoiding having to constrain my mind to complete administrative tasks, and having a break from the exhausting and unwilling assemblage of verbal and interactive hyperdata from all the other aspects of my everyday. I like the slow processes and processing of taming wood. I also prefer the company of tools to many other interactions. They're logical, obvious, and won't confuse me much. I also prefer um, a separate part of my intellectual engagement uh, with woodwork features analysis of labour and craft and their relationships with the co-production of writing. But that's for another day, and that, for now, is that about my life. I don't want to be disingenuous, but I also do not want not to be ingeniously, ingeniously disengaged either. There is autobiography here seeded, although its emergence in shoots and buds is erratic and restrained by evasive and hostile soils. Why? I've read dozens of wonderful and intriguing autistic memoirs by brilliant people, and I don't think I can yet write with the lucidity, confidence or grace that these possess. Also, this is poetry, the seat of mannered evasion, the mode of methodological metonymy. Directness is for the lingua frankly, and frankly, I'm not good at it. That being stated, the he and the I throughout may well betray accidental missteps of Gareth Farmer stumbling into semi-transparency, glimpsed before the reactive reassurances of opacity consume grammatical cogency. There may be no history of cynical realisation that is not also the twistery of complicit animadversion. Such a sentiment is sedimented in every line of this book. But, but, maybe this book does join the ranks of quirkle perkery. In which case, hi peeps. Sincerely though, with thanks to anyone who takes the time to read this book, I am grateful. Enjoy. Gareth Farmer, Shefford. 2nd of April, 2022. So this is just a reading from the first poem of Kerf, as a little treat for those listening to the introduction, uh, and um, for getting this far. This is called Cognitive Loading. Try working backwards from vision to enabling. Rules will efficiently inculcate as apparent roots. It's a cognitive stylation and anti-optimal, where approximations become neonatal satisfaction solutions. Loose bounds for a rationality outflanking algorithm. Abstractions are autisticized, operating out of formal bonds. Never to be understood beyond the iterations in glimpses. Dead ringer through identikitting the blasé balance of poise. Efficiency models of attributable experiential grids are rerouted through predictable tests of deficiency and desire. 
requiring local calculations, these modulations mimic progress. Options for availability logic or anchored expectation are erroneous. Rare it is to see social proof that stands up to reason. Recognise in others the baselines by which to rhythm boogie, understood as the popular, the grids by which to portion passion. Landmarks of cultural proprioception anchor the cognitive load. Ecological orientation within min minimised inaccuracy and risk. Oh, to know the way to happi happiness, that, that rationality to critique perk. For all else, produce a survey. What, to you, is contentment? Take buffet tables and their etiquettes, buffet etiquettes, hazard reducing the seductions of finger suck, conveyor comportment, unfurl the unconfirmed rumour about bacterial growth regimes, make bounded efforts not to cross contaminate crabby efficiency rules, be appropriate. It is never appropriate to fondle volivants, ever. Educational backgrounds are musts for the hierarchical heuristics, decision quickeners for the greater accuracy of class contagion, and mirror co-agency. Unbelievably, the knowing nod enables entrance, must have been the tome tuck, called out every high table awkwardness and Hegel-less small talk. Affect is a misnomer, unless rebarbative in Spinoza spin and served as such. Taste is another marker, itemised in the retro of classical cassette racks. Escalation of commitment uniforms up when challenged. Default to other cheek-torn, willing into abjection by objectionable ordinances. Gestalts, gestalts are naturalised as quick-think metaphors of progress, untethered to the phrases that birthed them and rapidly reassuring. Erroneously vulnerable, but adaptive in always seismic circle jerk. Severing with sanction those overexposed by heuristic refusal and defiance, scope neglect is not anomalous. It's a peak end rule, socialised.